We're continuing our discussion of how spinners are related to Lie groups and Lie algebras. In the last video, we discussed how Lie groups are continuous groups, such as the group of rotations in 3D space, called SO3 with capital letters. We also found we could write the three basic rotation matrices as exponentials of special 3x3 three three matrices called generator matrices, which live in the Lie algebra SO3, written with lowercase letters in a fractor font. The Lie group SO3 is made of 3x3 three three matrices where the inverse equals the transpose, and the determinant is 1. We found that this group's generators in the Lie algebra SO3 were traceless anti-symmetric matrices, and they obeyed these commutation relations here. In the context of Lie algebras, the commutator operation is also called the Lie bracket. We said these matrices belonged to the spin 1 representation of the Lie group SO3 and Lie algebra SO3, because these matrices are used to transform vectors, which are rank 1 tensors. In this video, I'm going to introduce the spin 0 representation, which transforms scalars, and the spin 1 half representation, which transforms spinners. This will lead us to talking about the double cover of SO3, which is SU2, also called spin 3. In the last video, I mentioned how the complex number i can be represented as a 2x2 two two matrix that squares to the negative identity matrix. In this way, all operations with complex numbers can be written in the form of 2x2 two two matrices. However, there are many different matrices of all different sizes that also behave like the complex number i and square to the negative identity matrix. We call these different matrices different representations of I. Similarly, the Lie algebra SO3 is defined by the following commutation relations between the three basis generators. We've already found one set of 3x3 three three matrices that satisfy these relations, but we can also look for matrices of other sizes which also satisfy them. The simplest solution we could look for would be the case of 1x1 one one matrices, which is the spin 0 representation. 1x1 one one matrices are just scalars with square brackets written around them. Since scalars commute with each other, the commutation relations automatically go to 0, so we're forced to set all three of the generators to be the 1x1 one one 0 matrix. If we exponentiate these 1x1 one one generator matrices, exponentiating to the power of 0 just gives the number 1. So our rotation matrices are just the 1x1 one one identity matrices containing a single number 1 inside. So we find that the spin 0 representation of the SO3 Lie algebra is just 1x1 one one matrices containing the number 0. And when we exponentiate these, we get the spin 0 representation of the SO3 Lie group, which are just 1x1 one one matrices containing the number 1. We call this the spin 0 representation because it tells us how to rotate spin 0 particles, which are represented by scalars. This representation tells us that when we rotate a spin 0 particle, this is the same thing as multiplying it by the number 1. In other words, spin 0 particles, represented by scalars, do not change when we rotate them. The Higgs boson and pi mesons are examples of spin 0 particles. The spin 0 representation is a bit boring, and for this reason we call it the trivial representation of SO3. But it's an important fact to know that spin 0 particles are unaffected by physical rotations. So for the SO3 Lie group, we know the spin 1 representation, which are 3x3 three three matrices, and the spin 0 representation, which are 1x1 one one matrices. But what about the spin 1 half representation, which would be 2x2 two two matrices? It turns out that there is no non-trivial 2x2 two two representation of the SO3 Lie group. The proof of this is a little complicated, and it will have to wait until the next video. But we cannot find 2x2 two two matrices that behave like the SO3 rotation group.
So how are we supposed to understand spin one half particles that are represented by spinners if we don't have two by two matrices that transform them? It turns out we're going to need to go on a detour, and instead of talking about the Lie group SO3, we're going to talk about the Lie group SU2, the set of two by two matrices that are unitary, meaning the inverse equals the Hermitian conjugate, denoted with a dagger, and special, meaning the determinant is one. In video number 10 of this series, I talked about how SU2 matrices are the double cover of SO3 matrices. When rotating a 3D vector, we normally use a 3 by 3 SO3 matrix. But we can also rewrite this 3D vector as a 2 by 2 complex matrix called a Pauli vector, and rotate it using a double-sided transformation with a pair of SU2 matrices that use half angles. So to transform a Pauli vector V with an SU2 matrix U, the transformation law is UVU dagger. However, if we replace u with minus u, the two minus signs cancel out, and we end up with the same transformation as plus u. This means that both plus u and minus u perform the same rotation. So for every SO3 rotation matrix R, there are two SU2 matrices, plus u and minus u, that perform the same rotation. This is why we say SU2 matrices are the double cover of SO3. In video number 12, we saw that SU2 was equivalent to the spin 3 group from Clifford algebras. In video number 10, we also showed that SU2 is shaped like the 3 sphere, with plus U and minus U located at opposite ends. If we draw a projection line through plus u and minus u that projects them to the same point, the result is the SO3 group, which is shaped like half of a 3 sphere, where if you wander off the edge, you're immediately taken to the other side. So to explore the SU2 Lie group, let's look at the corresponding SU2 Lie algebra. This ends up being the set of traceless anti-Hermitian matrices. The proofs for this are almost identical to the ones we saw for SO3 in the previous video. We used this theorem for a matrix A, which says that the determinant of E to the A equals E to the trace of A. Since the determinant of an SU2 Lie group matrix is 1, this automatically implies that the trace of its generator matrix must be 0. Also, the unitary property means u times u dagger equals the identity matrix. If we take the derivative of both sides, product rule gives us a sum of two terms equaling zero. After a little algebra and setting theta to zero, we get that the SU2 generator matrices must be anti-Hermitian, meaning m dagger equals negative m. So let's see what traceless anti-Hermitian matrices look like. If we start with a general 2 by 2 matrix with complex numbers alpha, beta, gamma, delta, the traceless property means that delta must equal negative alpha. The anti-Hermitian property means the Hermitian conjugate version of this matrix equals its negative. This means that alpha complex conjugate equals negative alpha. So alpha is a pure imaginary number with no real part. Also, gamma equals negative beta complex conjugate. So given this SU2 generator matrix, we have a purely imaginary complex number alpha and a complex number beta. This translates to three real parameters, A, B, and C. This means that all two by two traceless anti-Hermitian matrices can be written as a linear combination of these three basis matrices. If you've been watching all of this video series so far, you might recognize these as the bivector matrices in the Clifford algebra CL3. Recall that the Clifford algebra CL3 has a scalar, represented by the identity matrix, three vectors, represented by the Pauli or sigma matrices, and three bivectors and a trivector, represented by the corresponding matrix multiplications. The 2 by 2 SU2 generator matrices, which are traceless and anti-Hermitian, are exactly the bivectors in this Clifford algebra. 
Remember, the key properties of this Clifford algebra are that the basis vectors square to the scalar one, and orthogonal basis vectors anti-commute, so we can switch their order and get a negative sign. So let's take the two by two generators of SU2 to be the three bivectors from CL3. The subscripts on the generator correspond to the subscripts of the two sigmas that it is equal to. Now let's look at the commutator between GXY and GYZ. If we sub in the corresponding sigmas, we can swap these two sigma pairs here in exchange for two minus signs, which then cancel with each other. Then, sigma y squared goes to 1 here and here. Then we swap the order of sigma x and sigma z to get a negative sign, and we end up with negative 2 times sigma z sigma x, which is negative 2 times the zx generator. So using this choice of SU2 generators, we get these commutation relations. These factors of negative 2 are not desirable but we can easily remove them with a simple change of basis. We'll define the g tilde basis as the g's times negative one half. Remember, Lie algebra generators are like basis vectors. So we're just reversing the vector directions and making them half as long. With these extra factors of negative one half, the commutator of any two generators is exactly equal to the third generator. So with this new basis, we're able to remove the factors of negative 2 in the commutation relations. And I'm just going to use this basis for our SU2 generators from now on, written without the tildes. These three generators end up being equivalent to the unit quaternions, i, j, k, divided by 2. I showed the equivalence of the quaternions and bivectors in video 6.1. They all obey the same multiplication rules. Now, you'll notice that these SU2 Lie algebra commutation relations are exactly equal to the SO3 Lie algebra commutation relations. So, what's going on here? The two Lie algebras are equivalent, even though their corresponding Lie groups are not equivalent. Remember, SU2 is the double cover of SO3, so they are not equivalent. I'll come back to why this is later. So we have this set of 2x2 two two matrices that satisfy our SU2 Lie algebra commutation relations. But now we'd like to see the actual SU2 Lie group members that do the rotations. To see these Lie group matrices, we just exponentiate the generators. Let's compute the exponentiation of the XY generator times an angle theta and see what we get. Now, one option would be to use the Taylor series definition of the matrix exponential, and plug in all the matrix powers, and end up with this matrix as a result. This is correct, but it's a lot of work. It turns out that there's an easier way. Recall Euler's formula, which says that e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. This can be proven using the Taylor series of e, sine, and cosine and it works because the symbol i squares to negative 1. Now the bivector sigma x sigma y also squares to negative 1. This is easily shown using the properties of the sigmas. In matrix form, it squares to the negative of the 2 by 2 identity matrix, which I'm writing as this fancy number 1. Because of this, we can also use Euler's formula to rewrite its exponential. So if we exponentiate theta times the generator gxy, we can move the factor of negative one half so that it's part of the angle. Using Euler's formula, we get cosine of negative theta over two plus the xy bivector times sine of negative theta over two. We also put an identity matrix in front of the cosine since we're dealing with two by two matrices. Now, cosine is symmetric, so we can forget about the negative sign in its input. And sine is anti-symmetric, so we can move its negative sign out in front. So given this Euler formula, we can sub in the matrices, combine the cosines and sines into exponentials, using Euler's formula in reverse, and get this matrix. This is the SU2 matrix that rotates a spinner in the xy plane. 
We can get the YZ and ZX rotation matrices using similar Euler style formulas. The only difference is the choice of bivector in front of the sign term. These are the three SU2 rotation matrices for Pauli spinners in three dimensions. As an exercise, you can show that any matrix of this form is unitary, so its inverse equals its Hermitian conjugate. As a hint, you can remember that the Hermitian conjugate of a bivector just swaps the order of the sigmas. So to sum everything up, for the 2x2 two two representation of the SU2 Lie algebra, we can either view the generators as matrices, as Clifford algebra bivectors, or as unit quaternions. And we can exponentiate these to get SU2 Lie group members, which we can view as matrices, Clifford elements from the spin 3 group, or as quaternions. So, something worth noting here is that our SO3 rotation matrices on vectors rotate using angles of theta, but the corresponding SU2 matrices rotate with angles of theta over 2. The factor of 1 half comes from the 1 half in the SU2 Lie algebra generators. We needed this factor of 1 half to make sure the SO3 and SU2 Lie algebra commutation relations were the same. In the case of SO3 rotation matrices, if we rotate by an angle of 2 pi, we just get the identity matrix. This means that if we rotate a vector by 2 pi, the vector doesn't change, which is what we expect. Now, if we take our SU2 rotation matrices and rotate by an angle of 2 pi, we actually get negative identity matrices. So if we rotate a Pauli spinner by 2 pi, we get the negative version of that spinner. It takes a rotation angle of theta equals 4 pi to get identity matrices. So spinners require a rotation of 4 pi to come back to their original position. The reason for this is that the SU2 Lie group is the double cover of the SO3 Lie group. Remember, SU2 is shaped like a three-dimensional sphere, with matrices plus U and minus U located at opposite sides. Rotating by an angle of 2 pi takes us from plus U to minus U. Another rotation by 2 pi takes us from minus U back to plus U, completing a full rotation. However, to get SO3, we draw a line through plus U and minus U and project them to the same point, which is a rotation matrix R in SO3. Rotations in SO3 cannot tell the difference between plus U and minus U. And as a result, SO3 is shaped like half of a 3-sphere, where wandering off the edge immediately teleports you to the opposite edge. As a result, a rotation of 2 pi will bring you back to where you started. So in SO3, we only need a rotation of 2 pi to do a complete rotation. So to sum up this video so far, we saw that the 3D rotation group, SO3, has no 2 by 2 representation, or spin 1 half representation. We needed to look at its double cover, SU2, which had the same Lie algebra, to find the spin 1 half representation that rotates spinners. Now, let's go through a similar procedure for the Lorentz group, SO plus 1, 3, which is the set of rotations and Lorentz boosts in four dimensional space time, which also excludes reflections in time and space. Recall, the Lorentz group keeps the space time interval with one plus sign and three minus signs unchanged. The inner product of a pair of spacetime vectors requires this matrix called the Minkowski metric, with one plus sign and three minus signs along the diagonal. This is usually denoted by the Greek letter eta. If we change coordinates using a 4x4 four four Lorentz transformation matrix, capital lambda, the vectors will each transform with lambda inverse which means the Minkowski metric must transform with a pair of lambdas to balance out the change and keep the space-time interval formula invariant. So Lorentz transformations capital lambda are defined by lambda transpose eta lambda equaling eta. 
So the standard representation of the SO plus 13 Lie group is the set of 4x4 real matrices that leave the Minkowski metric invariant, have determinant 1, and whose upper left matrix entry is greater than 0. We find the generators of rotations are traceless and anti-symmetric, and the generators of boosts are traceless and symmetric. There are six basic Lorentz matrices in 4D spacetime, three rotations, which exchange two space dimensions, and three boosts, which exchange one space and one time dimension. I'm writing the boosts with these minus signs, since boosting your frame in the plus x direction will cause vectors around you to have their x components become more negative. I neglected to include this minus sign in some of my previous videos. In video number 9 of this series, we found we could also write a 4D spacetime vector as a 2x2 two two complex matrix that I decided to call a vial vector. This is Lorentz transformed by a double-sided transformation using SL2C matrices, which are the 2x2 two two complex matrices with determinant 1. For every SO plus 1, 3 matrix, there are two SL2C matrices, plus L and minus L, that do the same Lorentz transformation. So SL2C is the double cover of SO plus 1, 3. Now, what do the generators in the Lie algebra SL2C look like? Since SL2C Lie group matrices have a determinant of 1, we can use this theorem with matrix exponentials to immediately conclude the generators are traceless. Now, because SU2 Lie group matrices were unitary, their generators ended up being anti-Hermitian. But SL2C Lie group matrices are not required to be unitary, so there is no requirement that their generators are anti-Hermitian. Looking at a general 2x2 complex matrix, if we force it to be traceless, this means delta equals negative alpha. This leaves us with three free complex parameters, or six real parameters. These correspond to the three bivectors and the three vectors in the Clifford algebra CL3. These six matrices form a basis for all 2x2 two two traceless complex matrices. The bivectors, which are anti-Hermitian, generate the three rotations. And the vectors, which are Hermitian, generate the three boosts. As a reminder, these are the commutation relations for the SO plus 1, 3 Lie algebra. These should be the same commutation relations for the SL2C Lie algebra. We saw earlier in this video that the rotation generators needed a factor of negative one-half in front of the bivectors to make these commutation relations work out. For the boost generators, we must also put negative one-half in front of the vectors to satisfy the commutation relations. You can pause if you want to see the proofs that these commutations work out, or try to work them out yourself. This is the JJ commutator, the KK commutator, the first set of JK commutators, and the second set of JK commutators. Now, we've already seen that when we exponentiate the bivector generators, we get 2x2 two two rotation matrices that rotate spinners. And now, when we exponentiate the vector generators, we get 2x2 two two boost matrices that transform spinners. Notice that these boost matrices use hyperbolic trig functions. This is because the Clifford algebra vectors square to plus 1 instead of minus 1. And so the Euler's formula Taylor series has a bunch of plus signs, which give us hyperbolic trig functions instead of circular trig functions. Since the formulas for rotation matrices involve bivectors, Taking their Hermitian conjugate flips the bivector order and gives the inverse. So the rotation matrices are unitary. Since the boost formulas involve only vectors, which are Hermitian, all the boost matrices are also Hermitian. So the generators of the Lie algebra SL2C can be interpreted as matrices, as bivectors and vectors from the Clifford algebra CL3, 
and also as bivectors from the space-time algebra CL13, if we use this mapping here between the sigmas and the gammas. These bivectors in CL13 can be thought of as the equivalent of quaternions, but for four-dimensional space-time. We can also interpret the SL2C Lie group members in these three ways as well. Either as SL2C matrices, as members of the CL3 Clifford algebra, or as members of the spin 1-3 group in the Clifford algebra CL13. I talked about spin groups in video 12 in this series. So we've discovered the spin 1 half representation for 3D rotations, which is SU2 matrices, and the spin 1 half representation for 4D Lorentz transformations, which is SL2C matrices. There are some key differences between SU2 and SL2C that I'd like to explore. One big difference is that SU2 only has a single, non-trivial 2x2 matrix representation. But SL2C has two non-equivalent, non-trivial 2x2 matrix representations, which are called the left and right representations. To understand why space-time has both left and right spin 1 half representations, we need to do a parity transformation. I talked a little bit about this in video 9. A parity transformation is when we send all spatial directions to their negative versions. So it's a bit like reflecting the universe in a three-dimensional mirror. Let's see what happens to the 2 by 2 xy rotation matrix under a parity transformation. A parity transformation causes both x and y vectors to get negative signs which cancel with each other in the xy bivector. So the xy rotation matrix, and rotation matrices in general, are unchanged under a parity transformation. This is also true for the SU2 generators. This makes sense because rotating x into y is equivalent to rotating negative x into negative y. Now let's do a parity transformation on a boost. Since the boost formula only involves a single vector, it does result in a sign change. We can move this sign change into the hyperbolic sign, since it's anti-symmetric. And we can introduce a negative sign into hyperbolic cosine for free, since it's symmetric. We now see that a parity transformation on a boost results in a boost with the negative hyperbolic angle. In other words, this is a boost in the opposite direction. The boost generators also change sign under a parity transformation. This makes sense since if we have a boost in the plus x direction, reflecting the universe in a mirror will make it look like the boost is in the minus x direction instead. So we see there are two spin 1 half representations of SL2C. The original, which I'll call the left chiral representation, written 1 half comma 0, and the version where the boosts are reversed, which I'll call the right chiral representation, written 0 comma 1 half. Although, some sources use the opposite naming convention. Exponentiating these SL2C generators gives us left chiral and right chiral SL2C Lie group matrices. We can swap between the left chiral and right chiral SL2C matrices by taking the Hermitian conjugate and then the inverse. For rotations, the SL2C matrices are unitary, and so Hermitian conjugates and inverses are the same thing. So the left and right versions of the matrices are equal. For boosts, the SL2C matrices are Hermitian, so the dagger does nothing and so the left and right versions of the boost matrices are inverses of each other. These two representations are not equivalent, because we cannot swap between them using a change of spinner basis. I proved this in video 9, which is linked in the description. We can take a left chiral vial spinner and a right chiral vial spinner and take their direct sum which means stacking the two spinners on top of each other. 
the direct sum of their left and right SL2C transformation matrices would be a combined 4x4 matrix in block diagonal form, so that the left matrix transforms the left spinner, and the right matrix transforms the right spinner. This is a new representation, which is the direct sum of the left and right representations. The 4x1 column spinner is called a Dirac spinner. We can split up a Dirac spinner into the individual vial spinners using these projection matrices here. These can be written in abstract form using the Dirac matrices written in the chiral basis, where this term here is often written as gamma 5 for short. The next difference between SU2 and SL2C involves the tensor product of their representations. I've shown in previous videos that the tensor product of two Pauli spinners can give us a 2x2 Pauli vector, and the tensor product of two vial spinners can give us a 2x2 vial vector. I'm going to take this vial vector and separate out the time component, which is just a scaled identity matrix. This is separated from the 3D spatial Pauli vector, which I'm writing as V. Now, let's do a rotation on this vial vector, using a pair of unitary SU2 matrices. After breaking up W into time and space parts and distributing, we can move U past the identity matrix and cancel it with U dagger, since for unitary matrices, U dagger equals U inverse. The result here is that the spatial XYZ components of the vector transform under a 3D rotation with SU2 matrices. And the time component of the vector doesn't transform at all, so it behaves like a scalar. Now let's try this again, but this time doing a general Lorentz transformation with a general SL2C matrix, L. We can move L past the identity matrix again, but it does not cancel with L dagger, since in general, SL2C matrices are not guaranteed to be unitary. This basically means that the time component doesn't neatly separate out from the space components, since a boost can potentially cause time and space to mix with each other. This means that a Lorentz transformation does not always cleanly separate into a 3D vector rotation and a scalar component that does not change. We must treat the 4D spacetime vector as one object. Since the tensor product of a left and right vial spinner gives a 4D spacetime vector, and each spinner transforms with its own SL2C matrix, we can think of 4D spacetime vectors as transforming with the tensor product of a left SL2C matrix and a right SL2C matrix. If we Lorentz transform a vial vector to a new frame and carry out the matrix multiplications, we can set the matrix components equal to each other to get four equations, which can then be rewritten using a 4x4 matrix. This 4x4 matrix can then be rewritten again as the tensor product of a left SL2C matrix and the inverse of a right SL2C matrix. Now, the entries of a vial vector matrix involve the sums and differences of space-time coordinates, but we can easily change coordinates to the standard time XYZ coordinates using these formulas, which translate to this matrix and its inverse. Putting all this together, we can see this gives a 4x4 SO plus 1, 3 matrix that Lorentz transforms a 4D spacetime vector. And this SO plus 1, 3 matrix is ultimately just the tensor product of left and right SL2C matrices, along with a change of basis. This representation of the Lorentz group is denoted like this, or just as 1 half comma 1 half. So in space-time, the vector representation is really just the tensor product of two spinner representations. So even though a Dirac spinner and a 4D space-time vector both have four components, Dirac spinners transform with the direct sum of the left and right spin one-half representations, and space-time vectors transform with the tensor product of the left and right spin one-half representations. 
The last thing I'll talk about in this video is how the SU2 and SL2C Lie algebras are connected by complex numbers. When looking at the 2x2 two two representation of the SL2C Lie algebra, the three rotation generators are anti-hermitian and square 2, negative 1, and they form the Lie algebra SU2. However, if we multiply them by negative i, we get the three boost generators, which are Hermitian and square 2 plus 1. So we can think of the six generators of SL2C as being made of two copies of SU2, combined using the direct sum. One ordinary copy of SU2 for the rotation generators, and another copy of SU2 multiplied by plus or minus the complex i to get boosts. The plus or minus sign determines whether we get the left or right spin one-half representation. We call this the complexified version of SU2. So with the ordinary SU2 Lie algebra, we combine the generators using real scaling coefficients. But with the complexified version of SU2, denoted with this C subscript, we can scale the generators by complex scaling coefficients. Since SL2C is the direct sum of SU2 and I times SU2, we can complexify both sides and see that the complexification of SL2C is equivalent to two complexified copies of SU2. We can absorb the complex I inside the second SU2 since it's complexified anyway, so complex coefficients are allowed. This leads to an interesting trick with the generators. We previously defined the SL2C Lie algebra in terms of rotation generators, the J's, and the boost generators, the K's. In the commutation relations, the J's and K's get mixed together. Now I'm going to define a change of basis to the generators that I'm calling A's and B's. I'm going to rewrite the J generators using the axis they rotate around, instead of the plane they rotate in, and I'm going to drop the time T index from the K generators. Now I'm going to define the A generators as J plus IK over 2, and the B generators as J minus IK over 2, where I've matched the indices of the J's and K's in each formula. If we write out the commutation relations in this new basis, the A's and B's cleanly separate out into a pair of commutation relations, where the commutators of the A's and B's with each other is zero. These A and B commutation relations look exactly like the SU2 commutation relations. So in this way, the SL2C Lie algebra is sort of like a pair of SU2 Lie algebras. Since this change of generator basis involves scaling by the complex i, this means SL2C and both copies of SU2 have been complexified. So in this way, the complexified SL2C Lie algebra is the direct sum of two complexified SU2 Lie algebras.